All right, guys, welcome back. We're back with Jeff. We ran out of video in the last one because we are doing a part two series now of lands with Legacy. And guys, make sure if you guys want to watch part one, it will be in the link below. Uh, the first part of the video, we'll talk about the main deck. Um, and then now with this video, we're talking about the sideboard. But before we start with that, there might be a couple things you want to mention about the main deck that we forgot. Yeah, unfortunately, we ran out of time in the uh, first video. Um, and that's because this deck has so much going on. I hope everyone watching uh, can appreciate the intricacies of the deck. And there's just a couple other things that I want to talk about before we move to the sideboard. So there are some cycling cards in this deck. Um, the Tranquil Thicket is a cycle card. The Shelter Thicket is a cycle card. And again, we don't care about cycling because of life from the loam. So these are ways to generate extra card advantage. Um, you also have some ways to deal with some very unique opponent threats. Ghost Quarter is a staple. Um, everyone should be familiar with this card. And what it says is, you sacrifice the Ghost Quarter, you destroy a target land, its controller can search its library for a basic land. But in Legacy, a lot of people don't play any basic lands. Mm. So you sacrifice the Ghost Quarter, you take someone's land out, you loan the Ghost Quarter back to your hands, your opponent is basically struggling to produce mana. Between your wastelands and your ghost quarters, you are just punishing your opponent's mana source. Wow. So there are so many ways in this deck, besides the Merit Lodge um, token, to win this game. All right. So guys, that's awesome. Jeff, let's talk about the sideboard, but before we start with that, give us a quick rundown on if this deck, I mean, the way you're positioning it and selling it to people, this deck is incredibly powerful. But obviously, with uh, you know your experience in playing this deck at Eternal Weekend, there are some challenges. What are the, the greatest challenges that you're finding against this deck? <laughs> so the greatest <laughs> challenges with this deck, obviously, uh, first let me talk about the player themselves. Patience with this deck. You must be patient. And to be able to exercise your judgment and use that patience is a challenge in itself. And that was one of the challenges I found. Instead of just taking my time and realizing that I was okay, because I, I had the resources, I would sometimes try and force the issue and that would, that would cost me games. Um, the second challenge with this deck is people do have answers for Merit Lodge. Hmm. Not everyone does, but sometimes you'll get it down, it'll get bounced, uh, whether with a swords or path or something like that, um, and it's just gone. And now all the hard work you've done to, you know, you've gambled, you've crop rotations, you've done everything you can to get these two cards on the board is now for naught because it just, you know, got taken out. It doesn't always happen, but certainly a challenge with this deck. Your other challenge with this deck is if someone is playing a deck that is primarily spell-based and not creature-based, yes, you can control their resources, you can you know, destroy their lands, okay? But you don't really have anything in the way of counter spells or ways to prevent you from taking spell damage should they have the mana. So when, if you're playing a deck like Storm, for example, and they happen to begin the Storm combo, oh. you basically just have to sit back and watch them, you know, Storm up to eight, Storm counter up to 11, Storm counters up to 13, and there's nothing you can do. Sitting duck. You just yeah. have to sit there and, and, and wait for them to count their storm counters. Okay. And storm is a popular deck. Yeah. So to counteract that, let's talk about some of the sideboard options that you've selected. Sure. So some of these sideboard options uh, really focus more on taxing the opponent rather than trying to win the game with the Merit Lodge token. Mm. So first card here is Trinisphere. Trinisphere says, as long as Trinisphere is untapped, each spell that would cost less than three mana to play now costs three mana to play. So all of those cards in Legacy, like Brainstorm, um, you know, Delver of Secrets. This, you know, is, like, well, this is like the stacks, uh, the gold mine. Right? That's right. This was back in the. Did you were you allowed three, four of these back in the day? They they recently. Yeah. Oh wow. This yeah. is, yeah, this four of is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, obviously, if you're playing a deck that controls an opponent's mana, right. and they don't have a lot of mana, and now you have a Trinisphere down, oh, it's they're, a really, they're really in a bad way. Okay? 
Sphere of Resistance also works on um, taxing the opponent. All spells cost an additional one to play. All those blue decks that you're talking about. Yeah. You don't care because you're playing all lands. Okay? But if you have a Tabernacle down and now you have a Sphere down and now an opponent has very little mana because you've you've handled their mana source, it's just it's too taxing on their mana base. They yeah. can't stay in the game. Um, Thorn of Amethyst works very similar, except it's only for non-creature spells. Costs one less to play. So if you are playing a deck, um, you know, like Storm uh, or any spell-based deck, Burn. If you're playing Burn, right? Okay, Thorn of Amethyst is Incredible. excellent. Now, the Bajuga Bog is also in the sideboard. <laughs> and you asked me before we started this video, yeah. you said, well, you know, what's the point of playing a Bajuga Bog? Well, I'll tell you the point. If you're playing a mirror match against lands and you use Bajuka Bog's ah. ability, okay, exile all cards from target player's graveyard. So wow. if you remove everyone's lands from their graveyard, and, right. okay, including their loam, you take their loam out of the graveyard, it's, yeah. they're, they're in trouble. So this is very much a mirror match card. Now, if you're in a mirror match, though, they probably play that, too. They're going to have a Bajuka Box, probably, too. Where's Strip Mine in all this? <laughs> Strip Mine. Strip Mine is uh, not involved in all this. Um, or Mistress Factory. Yeah, it's just, unfortunately, not really huh. part of the deck. Um, it would be feasible, I think. Okay. Uh, I certainly think, it, you know, if a player wanted to put their own touch on the deck, I, I certainly would think But you don't think Strip Mine is effective? No, I think you have enough as it is. Okay. Um, you know, okay. if you were to present me with the strip mines, I'm not sure what I would take out. Because mm. as it is, it's pretty cohesive. But I mean for cyborg. Oh, for cyborg. Yeah, okay, okay. So yeah. that could be a potential. Absolutely. How about uh, the crossing grip and the pith needles? So the crossing grips are in case your opponent has any artifact or an enchantment that really is going to hurt you. And those in in uh, artifacts or enchantments include something like um, like a chalice of the void you uh, know, let's say they drop a chalice and they name two uh, well now you loam. can't cast life of the loam oops right? yeah. <laughs> so you know and that happens I right. played against chalices before where they said chalice for two and it's like wow what am I going to do so you always need to have crossing grips in case they do have enchantments or artifacts that can lock you down and the pithing needle is a staple uh, when it enters the battlefield, you name a card, activated abilities that card can't be played. Um, so it's a very much a situational card. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's in the deck for a specific counter, but it's in there just in case there is a card that's giving you trouble uh, and you need to make sure that, you know, that you're not hampered down. Last card, a Tireless Tracker. Tireless Tracker. So this is a card many people are probably familiar with from... Uh, Standard, okay? It uh, came out in... Shadows uh, of Innistrad. Uh, Battle for Zendikar, I think, right? It says Shadows of Innistrad, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. Shadows of Innistrad, you're right. Uh, when it enters the battlefield under your control, you investigate. And what that means is that you get a clue where it says, pay two, sack and draw a card. And whenever you sack a clue, you get a one plus one, one plus one counter. So the whole purpose of this card is to just generate a little bit more card draw should you need it. Mm. Um, it doesn't really apply to any specific counters, but uh, nonetheless, it is in the sideboards just to generate a little bit more. A little bit more what would you use this card for mostly? Tireless Tracker, you know, if, if, if I was playing against someone who, who maybe was uh, playing really quick, maybe they're playing Burn or something like that, and I needed to really get my cards out faster, I might throw a Tireless Tracker in there just so I can have some extra card draw. Because with this deck, one thing that you don't have is card draw. Got it. Each turn, you're using your loam, so you're sacrificing your draw, okay? And that's something you have to consider when you play this deck, is if you're gonna be loaming, you're not gonna be drawing. No loam, no, no bueno. Right, no so bueno. this is a way to kind of play with loam and still get some card draw. Got it. That makes sense. Guys, you heard it from Jeff. This is an awesome deck. This is Lance. Uh, he talked about the main deck again on another video. This is the sideboard. Um, you mentioned Jarvis Yu. He's a professional Magic player. He's actually top aided this uh, tournament. Uh, I think maybe won or gotten close with Lance. Yeah, Jarvis Yu is is, is the is the mainstay behind Lance. He's Bill Gates uh, of Lance. His deck. He, he loves it. Plays it. Um, 
And so uh, he, he has a video out on Lance as well. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to... Is this his build? This is actually... Uh, it's similar to his build. Okay. Um, I don't think he runs Rishidins in the main port. He might have a couple of tweaks. Uh, but the whole premise of the deck uh, is between these cards, really. Right. Um, e everyone's going to have their own flair on it. Um, but I'm glad that we actually sat down today yeah. and talked about this deck because on the surface you can see there's a lot going on. Yeah. It's not something to just pick up and go into a tournament and sit down and play because you'll lose. Well, Guaranteed. you did Well, you did it. I did it. <laughs> but but yeah. let me say, I also did a lot of research, uh, a lot of reading, and I, also, I went in prepared. So even though I didn't play it before that tournament, I was prepared to play it. Right. Okay. So this is a very difficult deck to play, but if you are a legacy enthusiast and yeah. you enjoy a challenge, I would encourage you to challenge yourself with lands because there's always something new to learn with this deck. There's always decisions to make, and it's not as tedious as playing some of the other decks. You constantly have to think on your feet, uh, but you do have the resources that you need in order to be a winner with this deck. Well, there you go, guys. Jeff, thank you so much. I'm gonna pan real quick. Uh, again, if you guys are looking to purchase a lands deck, uh, do not hesitate to contact me, vintagemagic.com, at contact us. Uh, I'm helping Jeff out. Um, the purpose of the video is more to be more informative. They'll probably sell, you know, honestly, by the time you guys may even watch this video sometimes. But again, the purpose was more about learning what lands is. Jeff, you've been really great, great community member. Guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hit like, hit subscribe. Jeff, thank you so much.